everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the panel on science communication for biodiversity conservation. I will just take a moment to quickly remind you that it is helpful if everyone keeps their microphones off so that we don't get any feedback. And um, you're welcome to have your cameras on if you like, but there are a lot of folks here and the speakers will be highlighted throughout. So you might as well turn your cameras off and perhaps save some bandwidth while you're at it. I am um, the moderator of today's event. I'm Dr. Caitlin Kite from the University of Exeter. And I just want to make a few uh, welcoming remarks before I hand over to Tony and Kartik to say a little bit more about the reason why we're here today. So science is paramount to reduce uncertainty when making decisions for advancing conservation. However, we know that science, or that conservation relevant science needs to ultimately reach audiences outside of academia if they're actually going to be useful. This particular event today is aimed at highlighting and broadening an important con conversation about the role of science communication for biodiversity conservation and how we can make the most of it. The event is brought to you by Current Conservation Magazine and the Society for Conservation Biology. The Society for Conservation Biology's mission is to advance the science and practice of biodiversity conservation on Earth. In turn, Current Conservation Magazine's mission is to tell the world stories from the field of con conservation in engaging ways to academic and non-academic audiences. It's at this intersection that Current Conservation and uh, the Society for Conservation Biology can leverage each other's work to foster conservation. More specifically, this event marks the beginning of an official partnership between the two organizations, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. Now, an increasingly important part of conservation is recognizing, preserving, and amplifying indigenous and traditional knowledge. And that starts with an acknowledgement that um, there's a long history on the land of indigenous people, and often that history is a violent one and it's an oppressive one, and it starts with people being pushed off of their native territories. So we want to note that many of the contributors and attendees today are joining from colonized spaces and or work in such spaces that had different traditional owners. So we'd like to respectfully acknowledge this inequity and its implication for our conservation and also social justice more generally. So thank you very much to everyone who is joining us. And let me now hand over to Tony and Kartik to tell us a little bit more about their organizations and the event today. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks. Um, great to see so many of you here. Give me a second while I try and make technology our friend. All right, uh, can you see uh, my screen? Yes. Cool. Uh, I'm going to you know, provide a very, very brief introduction to current conservation. I've, uh, I'm, I'm uh, CC's uh, founding editor. Um, and uh, while we've traversed a journey uh, over a 12 year period, uh, some of our, some of our goals have been sort of brought home to us in a, in a, in a, uh, in a new light uh, in this post pandemic world. Um, CC rests on three pillars, uh, conservation science, storytelling, and uh, visual narrative. Uh, another way to look at that is when we receive stories, we ask ourselves, uh, uh, is it based on, uh, on good science, on rigorous science? Uh, is it imaginative? And does it tell a good story? Uh, we started out uh, in um, 2007 to translate uh, conservation science for a general audience and started out largely with, re with, with uh, research articles summaries. Uh, but pretty soon after we started diversifying our content into, a, into other article types. Uh, and a few years later, we introduced the idea of illustrations to create a more engaging look. Um, and while we started out with illustrations really as a way to sort of uh, shore up our stories, uh, before we knew it, uh, we found that uh, we had become a platform where uh, art meets science. Um, a selection of our covers from recent issues. We also started out um, 
clearly at the bottom with with a single editor and uh, a part time assistant. Uh, but we've grown into a into a very dynamic team, including our uh, executive ed editor Devaki Parshuram, managing editor for several years, Manik Bansal, and our assistant managing ad editor Greta Sam. Uh, and we also have a largest team of uh, uh, on our editorial board. Uh, as well as an advisory board, uh, some of whom uh, uh, work on specific um, aspects such as our uh, research summaries and others uh, contribute more generically to the magazine. Uh, and we're also delighted to have a range of uh, columnists uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, and some, as you can see, are actually more than one person. Um, but uh, long story short, uh, I think what we're most excited about is uh, uh, is looking ahead, uh, particularly through this partnership uh, with the SEB. Uh, we've been wanting to expand the scope of our work in terms of long form research articles, reaching more read readers from non-academic backgrounds, uh, expanding our diversity initiative, uh, expanding our collaborations, and uh, contributing to, uh, to science communication in our, uh, I wouldn't say unique, but in our particular way uh, that I will uh, talk about a, a little more generally in the context of science communication itself um, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, I do wanna acknowledge uh, that CC is being supported by uh, essentially a, communicate, uh, a community of um, uh, nonprofits, uh, mostly in India and uh, philanthropic organizations. And I wanna uh, acknowledge uh, uh, these organizations for their support over the last decade. And uh, uh, with that, I will hand over to you, Tony. Thanks, Kartik. Uh, let me just share my screen here. And, uh, okay, so, so I'm delighted to participate in the seminar on behalf of SCB, um, Society for Conservation Biology. Uh, we're a membership organization with around three and a half thousand members worldwide, including students, academics, practitioners, and policy make makers. Um, I've been a member of SCB since uh, 1988, from my student years throughout my career in conservation practice with the Wildlife Conservation Society. And uh, there are a number of people who uh, also consider SCB as their professional home. Um, now, we are a network, a global network, of conservation professionals, students, early career conservationists, whose mission is to advance the science and practice of conserving Earth's biodiversity. And we do this in a, number, in a number of ways, through supporting our members, through publishing journals, by holding conferences and providing fellowships and training scholarships. And we partner with other institutions and organizations that share our values. Yeah, so we began as, a, as the uh, crisis discipline of conservation biology emerged in 1985, and that was the year of founding of the Society for Conservation Biology. And our focus has been on conserving um, the world, world's biological diversity. And our groups, uh, our current structure is that we uh, are divided into groups. We have regional sections uh, in, in all of the the world's regions, uh, and we also have a, a global marine uh, program. We, are, we have working groups and we have local chapters. And the local chapters are groups of members that are assembled into, um, into, into groups uh, that hold activities and um, represent what we do around the world. We have 40 chapters worldwide. Yeah, so we're here today to discuss uh, a collaboration to announce a collaboration between current conservation and um, and the Society for Conservation Biology. And SCB publishes three high quality journals, Conservation Biology, Conservation Letters and Conservation Science and Practice. And we're just delighted to be partnering with current conservation. And uh, we're going to hear more about that collaboration uh, through this session. Yes, 
So I'll uh, hand back to Caitlin at that point. Great, thanks very much. Um, so I just wanna do a, a quick little bit of housekeeping before we dive in, uh, just to tell you about the structure of the event. So first off, I'm gonna go through the panel and introduce everyone with their names and a quick bio. And you might already be thinking, depending on what I announce as their expertise, that there are certain questions you might want to follow up with. So you're more than welcome to put your questions in the chat. If there's a particular person that you want to ask a particular question, you can indicate that. Otherwise, if it's just a general question, then you can indicate that as well. And hopefully we'll have time for that in the second half of the session. But what we're gonna start off with after I introduce everyone is letting each expert really talk about their area of expertise briefly so that we can get a few pointers uh, about you know, what experiences they've had, what their perspectives are, and maybe some tips about the sort of work that they do. So we'll have that kind of personal approach and then we'll open it up to the Q&A from the audience. And then we will have um, just a, a quick closing at the very end. And you are welcome to use the chat throughout if you do want to talk to each other and answer each other's questions, ask for clarification and so on. We would just ask uh, that you keep it civil. And for everyone who came a little bit late, hopefully you've all got your microphones muted anyway, but please do keep your mics off throughout so that we don't get uh, any kind of bandwidth issues and, and loud noises. So with that, let me dive in to introducing our panel and perhaps each panelist, if you'd like um, to, to wave or turn on your mic so that you become the center of attention briefly, then that's fine. So first up is Kartik, who already introduced himself briefly. So he is faculty at the Center for Ecological Sciences, Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And he indulges there in his fascination for ecology and evolution, working with students on frogs, reptiles, birds, plants, reef fish, and other marine fauna. He is a founding trustee of Daction Foundation, which works largely with coastal communities on natural resource conservation and management. As the founding editor of Current Conservation Magazine, he believes that art and science must meet more often in creative and engaging ways. So thank you very much, Kartik, for being here. Thanks, Kito. I will move on to Malaga Navunga, who co-founded and leads as the executive director the Mikaya Foundation, which is based in Chimoyo, central Mozambique. Malagra is a forester by training and her experience includes many years of work in Mozambique with government ministries related to natural resources management, as well as international positions with the UN and international organizations working at the interface between environment and community development. So thank you very much to Malagra for joining us today. Next up is Sharon Gaina who is a National Geographic Explorer and a Global Fellow with the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. Sharon is an award-winning journalist. She covers a wide range of environmental issues with a focus on wildlife, ecosystems, and the threats that they face. Her work is published by National Geographic, the New York Times, Scientific American, and other outlets, and she's contributed to peer-reviewed journals, including Conservation Science and Practice. Thanks very much, Sharon. E.J. miller Goland is next on my list. E.J. is Tasso Leventis Professor of Bio Biodiversity at the University of Oxford. Her research includes developing and applying methods for understanding, predicting, and influencing human behavior. She aims to ensure that all her research addresses issues identified by practitioners and is carried out collaboratively with end users. Thank you for joining us, E.J. And finally, we've got Anthony who, as you already have seen, works at the Wildlife Conservation Society Center for Global Conservation, and of course is SCB's president-elect. He's a trained ecologist and conservation scientist and has worked for the Western Australian Department of Conservation and Land Management and the University of California, Riverside. He has 30 years of experience implementing and advising wildlife conservation and management projects in parts of Oceania, Asia, and Africa, with a focus on the use of technology. So that is our lineup for the day. And now I'm gonna go back through to each of those folks in turn, starting with Kartik, and ask them to tell us a little bit about their perspectives on science communication and conservation. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, so, uh, you know, I wanted to start out with, a, with how I, uh, you know, both a little bit of where I think 
current conservation fits in uh, you know, to the, the, the larger picture of science communication, but also sort of a, a more gen general framework for how I think about it. Um, so we largely think about science communication as communicating science to different stakeholders. You know, we're often talking about how do we, you know, put science in a language that, that we can communicate to policymakers, you know, people in government, how do we get them to understand, you know, rigorous science, you know, and, and this particularly comes up in the context of issues like climate change, right? How do we get governments to understand this? Uh, you know, and then, you know, uh, nonprofits and, you know, and, and other organizations are, you know, trying to get science across to the public, you know, to the, to the, um, uh, to civil society. Uh, and almost every nonprofit has some sort of an environmental education program. We're trying to communi communicate science to, uh, you know, to, to children or, or to youth. Um, and I actually think that, uh, I think those are all really important goals, uh, but uh, they, uh, they they miss a couple of things. Uh, uh, one of the things that they miss is uh, uh, is in fact that uh, that communication uh, needs to be a two way street. In, in all of these, in, in, uh, 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 perhaps they're not all implemented in in that fashion, but the way that this is constructed, it is really about you know teaching you know an ignorant person about about science, whether it's a, you know, a civil servant or just a member of the public. And I really think that especially when it comes to engaging with society and in, engaging with communities, it's really about knowledge going in, in, in two directions. Uh, so one of the things that I think is really important there beyond communicating commun science communication is uh, from, I, I'd like us to go from communicating science to society to connecting scientists to society. Uh, scientists as a, as a group tend to sort of uh, be confined to their ivory towers, uh, and if anybody does write about science, it's you know it's a good journalist or a good writer. Uh, you know, uh, people like 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 Sharon who've. Uh, Kartik, I think you're muted. Uh, how long have I been on uh, just 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 right now? Just a couple of seconds. I think maybe your hand brushed a key. <laughs> okay, thank God. <laughs> I'd, I'd hate to have to say all that again. <laughs> so, well, the, so uh, the point I was making was that really like us for like to be able to, uh, I think it's important that we connect scientists to society. And it's one of the reasons that in current conservation, we, um, one of the things that we do is, is get the scientific community to write for us and not just get articles written, you know, by professional writers who obviously are much better at it. But the fact of scientists engaging, attempting to engage themselves with society is, I think, an, is a very important goal. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I think is really critical is, uh, is using different, you know, media for that, for that communication. Uh, and so I said art started out as, as, as a, you know, uh, just something that would support the stories, but I actually think that art and music and theater are different ways that we have of communicating with each other beyond just words. And while CC does it with art, I actually think in the larger sort of uh, world of, of uh, I should no longer call it science communication, but, but science and society, we need to use all of these different media to uh, you know, share knowledge with, with each other. As actually humans have done for centuries. Uh, it's, it's, it's like scientists didn't get the memo. Uh, right, um, and uh, my final point would would be that um, uh, I also think that science itself can serve as a bridge. Uh, you know, there's there's so much today about citizen science, and you know, citizen science sort of started out as this way for sci for scientists to collect data at larger spatial and temporal scales. Uh, but where what I think many people are realizing is that one of the things that science citizen science does really well is is it engages civil society with you know, the world of, of knowledge through the medium of science. Uh, and we're actually finding, you know, through my work at, at Duction in particular with the fishing communities that we work with, that science is actually a very effective way to bridge um, uh, communication barriers between communities, the state, you know, scientists and others. Uh, I've, I've, I've said, you know, elsewhere that, that science is sort of the lingua franca of the state. Science, the state likes to talk in data and graphs and figures and so on. And for communities that bear knowledge in a different form, uh, science kind of becomes their English, 
you know, the, the, the way that you talk to foreigners. Um, and it, uh, we're, we're finding that it can actually be a, a, a simple and effective sort of language that, that can make different cultures meet. Uh, so uh, I just want to end by saying that uh, one of the things that, that, that got me into this was actually writing children's fiction. It had nothing to do with my work in, uh, you know, at the Indian Institute of Science or even at the nonprofit. You know, I wrote a children's story and someone illustrated it and it looked so beautiful. And I, I just got hooked on, you know, on, I got hooked on it and I wanted to do more of it. And then eventually I realized that, you know, bringing these together really sort of uh, creates a, a, a very powerful platform for, for us to engage on uh, for all sorts of issues related to the future of the planet. Um, so I, I don't know if I've rambled on longer than I should have, but uh, that's my spiel. Thanks, thanks so much, Caitlin. Thanks very much, Kartik. Uh, I will move on now for hopefully a different perspective from Milagra. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, okay. Well, uh, as Caitlin said earlier, I uh, work uh, in Mozambique right now. And uh, I consider that uh, my work put, puts me in that interface between knowledge, be it scientific or indigenous knowledge, and practice. And, uh, and I look at my work as, uh, uh, I look at myself as a conduit in that I facilitate processes that enable communities living in biodiversity rich areas not uh, to um, and most of those, those, those areas are targeted for conservation either by the state or by the world. Uh, so these communities can then use their indigenous knowledge to translate all the scientific knowledge that comes with policies and legislation to then incorporate those in, into, into their daily lives and see what it actually means. Um, and so when I look at when I looked at the title Science Communication for Biodiversity Conservation, I thought mostly about the channels and the tools we should, we should have at our disposal to be able to communicate. Because when, when we work with communities, we take it um, uh, for granted, of course, that they have, there is indigenous knowledge in that place. There is an understanding of the systems uh, within which or around which uh, they, they live. And as science brings in different ways of, of translating that knowledge or of deepening that knowledge, that is then uh, it's how can this be shared more effectively and more adequately to enable uh, then uh, communities to, to look at that, see um, what parts of their knowledge and existence actually relates to that and, and then make it easier for them to have conversations about it and define rules and regulations within their own uh, traditional systems that can help them then address or engage with policymakers, in, engage with each other and, and, uh, and with policymakers. And this comes not only as something that comes from, but even within themselves, as uh, markets evolve and individuals within the communities want to use one or another species for particular economic gain, they can always use uh, that, that loop that uh, going around indigenous knowledge and science to see how best uh, they can all uh, accommodate that new value chain, for instance, or uh, conservation, or whatever it is that they, they that might be uh, implemented in their particular community. So this, uh, um, a lot has been said before, which I agree uh, with Kartik on, in terms of um, that interface between between science and indi and indigenous uh, knowledge. So thank you. Thank you. That's fantastic. I've I've jotted down some notes as you two have been talking, and I've seen connection, bridge, conduit. So some very positive words there to describe that interface uh, that you were just speaking of. Can I move on next to Sharon, please, to tell us a little bit about your own experiences? Thank you, Caitlin, and hello, everyone. Um, I come at this topic not as a scientist, but as a communicator. You know, I write, photograph, produce multimedia, I edit, I work on documentaries. Um, 
I'm a National Geographic explorer, and and I also the last five years have have done a lot more work in public policy as a part of the Wilson Center in Washington D.C. Um, so you know I've written features, news stories, op-eds, co-authored you know peer-reviewed articles. Um, I'm also an investigative journalist that has delved deeply into global wildlife trade. Um, one really amazing uh, story I worked on I investigated wildlife trafficking from the Tiger Temple in Thailand for National Geographic, which helped shut it down and really raised public awareness about, you know, the the dark underbelly of, of wildlife tourism and wildlife trafficking, you know, through uh, Asia, through Thailand. Um, so, you know, to go back, I realized the importance of science communication some 20 years ago, you know, as part of a master's program in science, health and environmental journalism, I studied graduate level science. And I learned that in some cases, you know, part of my job as a science journalist was almost acting as a translator, conveying information on science and emerging research to the public in a way they could understand. Um, I currently edit part-time for an online publication called The Conversation. Um, it's, uh, you know, I'd like to share some of the tips that I share with, with our writers. The publication is completely written by authors with university affiliations, scientists, researchers, uh, and many of them have never written for mainstream media before. Um, and I, I tell you to consider pitching them ideas. Um, as scientists, you know, you're trained to write for peer reviewed journals, and it's a style that's, you know, incomprehensible to most people outside your specific field, um, or even to those outside your particular niche within that field. Um, you write and speak um, what is essentially your own language, it includes technical terms, acronyms, jargon, references to processes, methods, and other information that most people have no knowledge of. And Obviously, publishing peer review research is essential to advancing science, and it's required by the institutions you, you work for. Um, but the audience that you're writing for is essentially either your peers, maybe policymakers, but again, it's, um, it's, it's hard for many people to understand. Um, and that means that important research often remains locked away in scientific journals. And Scientists can be powerful agents for change, but the clock is ticking. It's critical that your work is shared out in the world beyond the realms of science or conservation, so it can have the impact that it needs to. You know, so many critical threats to all life on earth are colliding at this point. And it's a really long list that you all know, you know, from global wildlife trade, loss of habitat, cascading extinction crisis, ever more devastating impacts from climate change, pollution. And recently, we've all become much more aware of contagious and zoonotic diseases. And there's more, right? So how do we help people understand your work? How do you want help people understand your work? And the bigger question, how do you get their attention and make them care about important issues in a world where we're bombarded with media and social media? Um, whether your intent is to expand your own writing to, to target broader audiences or to better communicate your work in a way that engages media interest, it comes down to basic human communication, as Kartik mentioned, storytelling. Um, it grates against um, much of what you've been taught, and it means thinking differently. But no one is more passionate about your work than you. So you're the one that can create the most impact in talking or writing about it. And it's also important for you to control the message. And there's a lot of ways to do that. You know, first of all, identify key audiences. Who do you want to reach? Local community, the general public, policymakers, someone else. Then identify the relevance of your work for each of those audiences and hone your message. Distill your message down to the main findings and summarize it well. If there's a news hook, include it. For example, if, if major relevant legislation has just been passed somewhere, if there's uh, a new important initiative from an international organization, a nonprofit, an enforcement entity, it, it's, it's another way to get media attention, either an editor or a reporter to, to cover your work. Um, 
Whether you're preparing for an interview, writing for a general audience, communicating with your community or policymakers, describe your work or your findings um, as if that audience or that person has not had high school biology. I hate to put it out that way, but that's really the truth. And, and, and also the way you might describe your work to your mother or your neighbor. There's literally like in the media a thing like, you know, the, the mother test, right? Um, and keep in mind that reporters or editors, you know, want you to answer the basic questions, who, what, when, where, why, how, and phrase clearly and succinctly. Um, if you're writing, make sure there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. An article for a media outlet is structured completely differently from the way you're used to writing for a journal. Um, you need to completely flip the structure that you're accustomed to. Um, start with your conclusion, your findings, and then uh, convey uh, the rest, you know, in an engaging, descriptive, narrative way. Outline significance, then how you did the study, and have a strong ending. Use specifics rather than broad statements. Use active verbs. Avoid jargon. Biggest thing, if you take nothing away from anything I'm saying, avoid acronyms, avoid jargon. Um, and um, if there's a term that you absolutely must include, explain it simply. Um, comparisons and analogies go a long way. For example, people's eyes glaze over if you say an area is 8 million hectares. But if you add that it's almost as big as Ireland, you keep, them atten you keep their attention. Um, giving con context is also really important. For example, if a species is disappearing from your area, offer some brief history of how and why it happened, over what period, and possibly explain what the cascading impacts are to the ecosystem from that animal's disappearance. Um, the legal framework relating to an issue may be important to mention, or pending legislation, international treaties, more. Um, people need to understand why your research matters, and it needs to be explained in an accessible way. Um, one thing, if you're being interest, uh, interviewed, um, be really clear what's on and off the record um, to protect yourself. Some ideas on how to get your work out to a wider audience. You might want to consider write, writing op-eds for newspapers or pitching stories to media outlets, perhaps magazines that cover science, natural history, or news. That requires a few paragraph story pitch. Um, you know, I've co-written white papers with researchers detailing issues and solutions. That's another way. Um, and a really powerful way to get attention for your work is through visuals. It's something that I've seen up close because my you know, longtime partner is Steve Winter, a photographer for National Geographic. Um, document your work in the field or in the lab. Fo you know, photographs go a long way. Video goes even further. Video really gets attention. And the files on smartphones are big enough for web use. Shoot tight, medium, wide shots of everything from animals and their behavior to the landscape, the threats they face, you know, researchers, local people, and successful conservation efforts. We all need to hear success stories. Um, you know, Steve Winter, you know, he, he did a story on, on cougars um, and, and, you know, photographed a cougar that was in the largest urban park in the U.S. in L.A., became known as the Hollywood Cougar. The Cougar became a celebrity. And this year, California is breaking ground on the largest wildlife overpass in the world over a 10 lane, you know, California freeway to co connect to protected areas. You know, this work can really have impact. And, and again, really think about the visuals. Um, another great source is National Geographic. Their grants program is currently on hold because of the pandemic but the work of their Explorer grantees gets a lot of attention. It gets you know, really amplified. Or, you know, write a book, work with a film crew on a documentary. I mean, there's lots and lots of ways to get your work out there. And, you know, if you'd like training in writing for broader, broader audiences, a really good source is Compass Science Communication, um, really helps you develop, you know, those kinds of skills. And the goal is sharing your work widely. Awareness sparks public understanding and support for conservation of species and ecosystems, and it brings funding. And again, unless we educate policymakers and gain public support that 
places pressure on policymakers, um, your work isn't going to spark the important changes that it really should. And the last thing I'd like to say is that you know we're 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 at a very specific moment in time. We're a year into this pandemic. Um, it's educated many people about the interconnectedness of our world, about wildlife trafficking, and it's made some people realize that wildlife health, ecosystem health, and human health are deeply in interconnected, which is really one of the only reasons some people will care, right? Um, it means that the public's gained greater understanding of conservation issues. Ears are open wider. Get your work out there. And, um, and I'll leave it there for now, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon. I, I sometimes give sessions on how to do science communication, so it's a relief to hear you saying some of the things that I <laughs> advise to my own students. Fantastic. Can I now hand on to EJ to tell us a little bit about your perspectives? Sure, yes. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I speak as a professor of conservation in a traditional university. Mm. And I think, um, one of the key things to say is that um, as scientists, we have to remember that we are part of society and not apart from society. It comes back to what Kartik was saying. I'm here, let I'm here. What's happening now? Let me just um, ask maybe for Harry to mute. That's good. Um, so we need to be responding in our science communication to the concerns of our citizens and helping them to empower um, themselves. And I think a lot of what we do as scientists instead is to transmit information or to tell people off to scold them. And people don't like to be scolded. So if you can engage with people on their terms and in their media, then it really helps. So I'm just gonna use the example um, of conservation optimism, which is something that I started in 2016. And it was based on an inspirational talk that Nancy Knowlton of Ocean Optimism gave um, at the Student Conference on Conservation Science in, in 2016, which was really brilliant and it started off as a one-off symposium but um, the kind of desperation for this kind of optimism amongst young conservationists and older ones as well um, meant that it morphed so that now four or five years later it's a brilliant team of volunteers and employees and um, advisors all of whom are working really um, closely together to, to make um, you know a real difference I think. And we've now started some um, hubs, so one in India, one in the UK, and we're hoping to get one in West Africa next year. So within conservation optimism, I just got to, want to give you one little example that illustrates um, some of the things that I want to say, and that's um, a youth resources section that we have in the website. Um, and it started off because during COVID, you know, the first wave of COVID in um, April, sometime like that, I really felt that teens were and young people were suffering and didn't really understand what was going on. And there was a lot of stuff around wildlife trade in, in the press. I wanted to give teenagers some information about illegal wildlife trade and about um, its relationship to COVID. And I thought that would be a way to help them. Um, so my um, scientists in my group who work on IWT did some fact sheets. Um, and that was great. We put them up there, very colourful, they're lovely. But that then led on to one of my students doing an Instagram takeover to talk about her work on pangolins. It led to us commissioning a podcast on eco-anxiety from a climate psychologist. Better still, it then led kind of just self, you know, self-motivated some biology students in our university self-organizing to make some short videos about how they interacted with nature during lockdown which kind of comes to the kind of more artistic thing that um Kartik's talking about there was some art as well that they did um and then you know we just got a lot of bottom-up content so I, the the lesson I took was okay so it started with something rather traditional which was the kind of thing that I as a 50 something year old conservation biologist would want to do but because there was the opportunity in the platform it blossomed into something that allowed all sorts of people to participate in all sorts of different ways. Um, so coming back to my theme about the responsibility that we have as conservation scientists to give hope and resources to people in the wider world about being able to make changes. Um, and I think that's important because people need to feel in this kind of fairly gloomy time that there is a way forward. And so another thing that um, I and a group of friends have started during lockdown is something called Pledge for Our Future Earth, which is something where we can help people to find uh, resources about how to change 
um, their behavior and actually commit to changing their behavior. So just to finish off, I would say that I am not the greatest science communicator in any way. I'm a fairly traditional academic. Um, we all have our limits, um, but I, I do feel that over the time that I've been in academia, I have learned, I've made myself learn, even though I might not have wanted to, I can do better and I, and I have. And the other thing is that I've been really trying to facilitate other people in my group and other people who I come into contact with to also embrace the pain of science communication and realizing that it's not so bad, um, facilitate them and mentor them so that they have the confidence to communicate their work and to see it as an integral part of their role as conservation scientists. Um, and then kind of come up with all the imaginative ways of communicating that we've heard from, from Kartik and from Sharon. So thank you. Thanks very much. And I, I really like your kind of subtext meshes there about how you don't have to do this alone. You can do this with colleagues and we can help each other out, uh, which is exactly what this partnership, I think, uh, exemplifies. So if I can finish up on my trip through the lineup here with Tony, would you like to tell us a little bit about your thoughts? Sure, thanks, Caitlin. So I've got some slides to show. Um, and I wanted to talk about how we connect scientists to each other and how we connect their messages to the public. So I want to talk about conferencing. And conferencing is a, a kind of um, favorite topic uh, for me because I started out as a, as a student, as an undergraduate student, um, and then went into academics and then came out and uh, after my graduation was a postdoc. Uh, and then I, I, I went into conservation practice. And all along, at all steps of my career, I benefited from um, having uh, the opportunity to attend conferences. And conferences, uh, I want to talk about the importance of conferences for bringing together academics, practitioners, policymakers to communicate about science. And, you know, if conferences are important, then how can we ensure access and participation to those events? So we know from our members that they value conferences as opportunities to network and communicate the findings of research and conservation. And SCB runs conferences, global and regional conferences, and these have historically been really well attended. So participants in our conferences get to talk, get to uh, share their posters and uh, communicate the findings of their science. They join panel sessions and interactive workshops. And there's, of course, informal networking on the sidelines. Well, one issue facing conferencing is location. And a study published in Nature not long ago found that about 40% of conservation and ecology conferences over the last decade were held in places which were perceived as not particularly welcoming to all. So we have to be careful where we, we hold our conferences. Um, so given those considerations, um, this last year, or the last 18 months, has been a real challenge uh, due to COVID. And our in-person conferences, which normally provide opportunities for networking and research exchange haven't been able to happen. And that's because we haven't been able to get to places. We've been locked down. We've been forced to stay at home. So we need to look to alternative models to bring scientists together. So can online spaces for science communication, conferences, webinars, seminars, online co co uh, courses help ensure access for all? Well, um, two studies that I've shown here have demonstrated that in fact, uh, we can be very effective at bringing people together, even in the absence of physically um, attending conferences. And hybrid conferences can help to remove the barriers that traditional conferences um, impose. And they can help to improve participation, diversity, inclusion, and reduce environmental impact at the same time. And uh, two great examples from uh, the last year are our International Marine Conservation Congress and our North American Conservation Biology Congress, which were fully virtual events, which had incredible participation 
because people were able to to join online. So we had, for example, in the in the IMCC six, we had participants from all around the world, from Canada, from Myanmar, from um, Southeast Asia, from Africa. It was an incredibly um, good uh, opportunity for uh, for for people to participate. And and here's some examples of some congresses uh, that SCB holds. So we have regional and local conferences, and these provide opportunities for students and early career scientists to meet and network with scientists. Um, they're organized by sections and by chapters, and the aim of our uh, conferences, uh, our regional and local conferences, is to, to reduce the barriers to participation um, and to, to make it easier for people to participate, especially people coming from lower incomes. Um, so, so this year, our, our conferences have moved to, to fully virtual, and they've been very successful. And just at the bottom here, you'll see some examples of our con congresses um, in the bottom right-hand corner. This is the China Conservation Biology Congress, which is held by our China chapter, which is a really engaged group of about 200 scientists and, and, uh, and students who get together every December to hold a com conference. And I had the opportunity to join that conference in 2015. And it was just a fantastic experience. Uh, there was so, so much uh, excitement. Uh, people came from all parts of the country and there were environmental reporters that sat in the, in, in the, uh, the audience and took copious notes and interviewed the scientists and, and students and got their message out to the public about what was going on. Uh, in the left-hand corner uh, of, the, of, of the slide is our Conservation Asia Congress, which we held in Singapore in 2016. And uh, this was hosted by the National University of Singapore. It was another opportunity for um, our, our members from around Asia uh, to, to join and to uh, participate and, and to network and to get their word out. Um, and these congresses were, were uh, especially effective. Now, I want to talk a little bit about ICCB. So ICCB is our global forum for uh, getting people together to talk about conservation challenges and presenting new research and developments in conservation science. And, and we meet because we want to bring the global community of conservation pr professionals together, and especially students. So this is a major networking event for anyone interested in conservation. Um, and uh, ICCB has been held in a number of different countries and in, uh, in the past. We celebrate the diversity of our field and strive to provide a safe and inclusive event wherever we hold it. So one of the things that we've done to get our message out to the public is to create declarations. And at the ICCB in Kuala Lumpur in 2019, the, the, the members of, or the participants of the, the Congress got together and put together this document called the, the Species Extinction Crisis is a Crisis of Humanity. And this was a, a really, really good way for people to participate in putting together a message about what needs to happen to address this uh, issue of uh, species extinction um, and uh, the, the sixth uh, 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 extinction crisis. We issued this declaration and uh, as part of the declaration, ICCB participants called on um, uh, uh, their, their organizations and members around the world, including government agencies and research institutions and NGOs and the private sector to contribute to a new strategic plan for biodiversity and to support various conservation initiatives. And we got a really important message out to the public and it was picked up by local media. And as Sharon said, it's really important to reach out in a way that um, is, is different from the way that we've been reaching out to each other. So we talk to each other with our, our science, we publish our papers, but when we spread the message to the public, we need to be appealing to uh, the, um, the, the uh, uh, um, uh, 
that's the will popularize our science. So Nat Geo, uh, Medium.com, uh, Scientific American, Mongo Bay, uh, these are outlets for our science. And we need to, to speak in a different way when we're talking about our science. Um, and we're getting better at doing this. And hopefully with our partnership with current conservation, we're going to be even better in the future. So at that point, I'm going to hand back to Caitlin. And if there are any questions, please type them into the chat for me. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Tony. And thank you to everyone who just um, gave us their thoughts on science communication and their experiences with science communication. Now, obviously we have eight minutes left until the end of this event. So it's not gonna be possible for us to be able to answer every question. We've had a few sent through. And what I'd like to propose is that we will write those down and hopefully we'll be able to get a response to anything that we can't answer here uh, through social media. Uh, so we can use our various Twitter accounts here and make sure that people do have an answer. But what I'd like to do is hopefully just have a quick lightning round for one of the questions that came in earlier. Uh, so if, if each of the panelists in turn would like to have one minute or less to answer the same question, it would be great to get your perspectives. And that question is, what do you do when you want to engage in science communication where perhaps you don't have uh, a very open audience? So maybe the audience is resistant, they don't like your particular message, they don't care about science, but you are actually having to actively overcome that barrier. Um, so maybe we can go in reverse order since I can see Tony here on my screen. So Tony, how would you handle that situation? Uh, it's a good question, Caitlin. So I think that uh, we have to know the audience and uh, uh, who, who is out there that we're appealing to. Are we, are we talking to um, uh, decision makers? Are we talking to academics? Are we talking to conservation practitioners? Who is it that we're trying to appeal to? So we need to know the audience and we need to create the message for them. We need to try to speak their language. <laughs> so, you know, if we're, if we're out there and we're talking to you know, government officials, you know, we're going to be using a different language from the language that we might use if we're talking to um, uh, conservation practitioners uh, or NGO um, uh, uh, workers. So we need to think about the language. The language really is important. And if we can get the language right, then we can be more uh, effective at communicating our message and, and being appealing to those people who are resisting us. Yeah, I'll hand over to the next Great, speaker. thanks very much. Yeah, the, the next person on my list is EJ. EJ, would you like to take a stab at that question? Yes, yeah, so beyond the language, I guess I would add the content. So there's always something that is of interest to them that is a hook that would draw them in that's, um, you know, that is relevant to their lives. So don't start with the thing that you think is most relevant, start with the thing that is most relevant to them. Great advice, thanks very much. Um, next on my list, if I can read my own writing, uh, I believe it's Sharon. I think it's important to, you know, be factual, um, be concise, um, include any really fascinating facts. Um, it's also important to not just appeal to minds, but to appeal to hearts. Um, I think it's, and, and storytelling. I mean, again, even if you're talking to a policymaker, you know, there's, there's some way that you can engage them in, in a conversation, in, in, um, in a human way that isn't just about spouting facts. Um, Although, you know, use the great facts. Um, but again, what Tony said, it really needs to be tailored to whatever audience it is. That's... Great. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, Malaga, you are next on my list. Do you have another tip to add to the list? Um, well, I think uh, it, it is very important to know who they are. I think somebody said, I know your audience. I think that's very important. And by that is also uh, through that, you will know what matters to them, who they are and what really matters to them. And if you know that, and you also know how they usually communicate in their own uh, groups, how they, they communicate with each other, you can see how best you can um, 
you can accommodate the message that you want to you want uh, to pass through using the same channels, using the same tools, because that's that's their comfort zone. That's where they get their information. That's where they 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 get what they need. But also uh, knowing uh, in knowing what matters to them, uh, we could look at um, what could they use that information for, and uh, knowing that will also uh, tell us how best to pass it on to them so that they can make the best use of the information we are trying to, to communicate. Great, thank you. Um, that leaves us with Kartik to be, to have the final say on this question. So Kartik, how do you overcome these barriers? Well, you know, uh, as uh, appropriately as the, you know, the editor of Current Conservation is, isn't gonna be, come as any surprise, that I'm gonna start by saying, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and as humans have known for 10,000 years, you know, like from the days of cave art, it's, um, I think it's, it's a very effective way to, uh, to capture, uh, you know, parts of your, um, uh, the ways of understanding that words don't necessarily do. And as, you know, Sharon said, capture their, their, their hearts as well as their minds. And I think uh, images, uh, you know, whether it's photographs or illustrations or, you know, ways of, of visually communicating information, do that in, in, in ways that, that words uh, can't. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I'm, I'm gonna say very often that when we, when we design products for particular stakeholders, whether it's a community or, or a government officer, we, we try and do it with the kind of, of, of graphics or visuals that will, you know, sort of capture their attention. But, but the other thing that I do want to say, which kind of goes back to my, to, to my other sort of uh, soapbox is that people don't want to just, don't just want to listen. People want to be heard. And even when we're trying to communicate science or, or communicate a point of view to uh, whichever stakeholder it is, I think it's, it's really important. You know, one can't do it, you know, when one's publishing an article or writing a report, but in the larger scheme of interaction, I think it's important for us to, not just tell them what we think or know, or think we know, uh, but also to really listen, uh, listen to what they have. Great, thanks very much, Kartik. Um, and I see we are in our final minute now, so I will have to do a really quick summary. Um, we're basically, I, I just want to reiterate that we have had some really nice questions here in, in the chat, and we will find a way to answer those, whether it's through Twitter or we send out an email to all the participants, but we will pick those back up. Uh, and, and one of the ones that's been asked here is about, you know, are you a scientist first or a communicator first? And I think that that's certainly a theme that's kind of come up through the day is the different perspectives, both as um, thinking about your audience, but also thinking about yourself and the different messages and, and really working all of that through so that you can have a good conversation and make it two way and not just one way. So hopefully we've had a chance to entice you a little bit with these fantastic thoughts from this wonderful panel. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to everyone who's come. Um, we will also, in, in uh, following up with you, we will answer questions, but we'll send out these details as well. But I just wanna make the pitch that everyone who is interested in this sort of thing should definitely think about how they can take their work and contribute to current conservation. Um, so that you can take your scientific expertise and translate it into something for the public. So please do um, take advantage of this new partnership and send in some pitches and some submissions. You can see the, the information there on the screen, currentconservation.org slash submissions. Uh, and I think I will leave it there because it's three o'clock on the dot, my time. I know that you're joining us from around the world. So thank you very much to everyone and good luck with your work. <laughs>